Hello and welcome once again to You Tell Me That, a programme about the more unusual aspects of this province of ours. And I'll start as usual with a puzzle. What do you think this thing is? I'll give you the answer later in the programme. My first visitor this evening is with me because of his hobby. Incidentally, this might give you a small clue to the puzzle. With me is Jim Parker. And Jim, I believe you've made for yourself a bed of nails. Few people do that. Why did you do that? Well, I was involved in various aspects of theatre, Alex. But then, quite by accident, I discovered that I got much more of a kick out of the more dangerous, more exciting side of it. So... That's what led up to the bed of nails, as such. And it's both dangerous and exciting, I would say. How did you ever make it? With a lot of time, effort, and just plain hammering, Alex. It's quite difficult, I assume, to get all these nails in and get them all the way you want them. It's not so much difficult as important. Yes, for your own safety, for I suppose. For your own safety, indeed. <laughs> indeed. And how much would a bed of nails cost? This one, Alex, cost approximately £150. That's just the nails. The That's board just... came free. Ah, so you, you got some help, I hope, with that. Um, I'd say about 75% of that came from um, grant aid from the Arts Council here in Northern Ireland. And uh, is there any special knack now in lying on this bed? Just to do it quickly, but at the same time gently. Yeah, so you lower yourself down gently onto it. You certainly do. <laughs> Uh, have you had any funny experiences when you've been lying on it? Um, several funny experiences, Alex. One in particular that always strikes me was at Larne. As a matter of fact, where I'd, I'd slipped, cut my back, you know, and you had three distinct parts of the audience where you had the part that were shocked and horrified, the part that were <gasps> really, let's get into it, and the, the ones in the middle that didn't know what to think. Yes, and I suppose you were suffering all the time. I didn't even know oh, anything had happened. <laughs> I was just gelled up with all the excitement and yes. the atmosphere. Do your friends think you're a bit mad doing this? More than a bit, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I believe you belong to the community circus and do this quite often. Oh, that's just one of many things we do with the community circus, Alex. Well, would you like to do it for us now? Certainly. Let's see you lying on the bed. Now, Jim is lying on the bed of nails and quite comfortable. Mm -hmm. I believe, Jim, that you even allow people to stand on top of you when you're lying there. Would you like to have a go, Alex? No, I think that would be a bit too much, maybe. But Sandra is here, and Sandra will do it. You wouldn't mind Sandra stepping on top of you, I'm sure. Good. There we are. Now for the first of this evening's film reports by Joe McKee. Many of the locals say that the Mourne Mountains are seen at their best when all is bleak with ice and snow. So last winter, Joe went to see for himself. Hello. You may think with all this snow, snow and ice, that I'm in the Alps, but I'm actually in County Down. Sorry, sorry, camera. Actually, in County Down, in the Kingdom of Morn. Just up above. Sorry, sorry about this. I don't quite know what's going on there. We'll come back to it once we've found the right film. In the meantime, let's go on to a strange but true tale from County Fermanagh. 
This is Temple Manor, the this home of Rosamond Temple Lady Manor, Langham, the home who's been telling Joe Langham, about the days when the Maguires, who, who gave their name to Maguires Bridge, used to hold horse races in the grounds of the estate. This story is about um, a Maguire who didn't want a certain horse to run in the race the next day because he was afraid of it beating his own horse in the in the races and so he was determined that he, uh, to get rid of the horse and the trouble was that the stable boy was sleeping with it in the stall so he didn't know how he could get at it to nobble it so the story goes that he came in at night and he murdered the stable boy and he uh, shoved the little body under the big slab stone at the, at the uh, entrance to the stable, which is the one we're standing on here now. When my, my father-in-law came to live here, he got the workmen who were working on the stables to take up the flagstone at the uh, stable door and just to look under it and see if, if the story was true. Well, and there, think... sure enough, it was the crumpled up body of the stable boy was under the stone. At that time, my father-in-law was making a museum here at Temple, and he had a lot of stuffed birds and butterflies, and he also had a collection of monkeys' uh, skulls and apes' ape skulls in the, in the house. And he thought, why not bring in the little stable boy skull and add it to the collection? And that is what he did. He brought in the Scaber Boy skull and he added it to the collection. And from that moment onward, everything went wrong in the house. The uh, chimneys caught fire and the people fell down the stairs and everything went wrong in the house. So my father-in-law thought, oh, it must be because I'd brought in the Scaber Boy. And so he took the little skull and he brought it out and he put, put it back where it belonged. So now we've arrived at the end of the story. Well, not quite at the end of the story, because there was um, a more or less a postscript to it. <laughs> when my husband and I came to live here, my husband thought, well, he'll bring in a couple of calves, which he did. He brought them in and put them in the stall where the stable boy had been. And uh, it was most extraordinary, it was as if the uh, calves had taken fright at something uh, as terrible as they'd seen in there and they both started to jump through the glass window of the stable and they cut themselves to pieces on it and so of course we had to take the, the calves out of the stall immediately. Well, they, uh, a short time after that we put two more calves in there. I don't know why we did when that happened, the first one, but we put two more calves in there and this time they got some extraordinary disease that the um, vet couldn't diagnosed at all. There was something wrong with their legs and they were very sick indeed. And so they again had to be taken out of the stable. My grandson has come to live here now and he's running the farm for me. And so last year he put ewes and lambs in that stall and uh, I was wondering how they'd get on but they got on perfectly. Nothing happened to them at all. Uh, this year again he intends to put more ewes and lambs in that same stall and so we hope that the little stable boy is now at rest. The last resting place of the stable boy of Temple Manor. And what a delightful lady to tell us the story. Now, do you remember that large cylinder the men were carrying up the stairs at the start of the programme? This imposing building is the Argory, a National Trust property near Moy, and inside an organ driven by this barrel, a true barrel organ. It's going to play for us a piece from Mozart's The Magic Flute. Is the button engaged there? Yes. Good, that's grand.
the James Bishop organ, built in 1824 for the Orgery. I suppose you could call it the biggest musical box in Northern Ireland. Here's another cylinder, rather the same. What do you think? We filmed this at the Wayside Inn near Doch, where it's been the custom over the years to hammer coins into the beams and make a wish. I'm told this goes back to the days of coach and horses, when a passenger arriving at a hostelry would push a coin into the ceiling and make a wish that the coachman would return to collect them after his merrymaking. Now there's a pub where they're never short of change. One, three, three, take seven. Hello. Well, you may think I'm in the... <laughs> Sorry about this. <laughs> <laughs> We're all a bit potty on, We're you tell me that. But we've really done it this evening. Another unusual collection. Another unusual this time of chamber pots. And the lady who has made the collection is with me, Mary Campbell. Mary, what made you begin a collection of this kind? Oh, I don't really know. Having a couple of my own below the bed and interested in antiques and being in and out of shops all the time I sort of got a few gathered up and sort it of grew from that just then. grew from there yeah. do you have to take a lot of stick from your friends about this collection oh very much so there's one person actually in Killalee Roy Rogers you call him <laughs> and every time he sees me he's shouting over the street well how's the parties have you got any more and could you lend me one and so on you know how, how so, many have you all together oh, about 36 or 7 uh, have you any special ones? Oh, well, there is a few. Um, There's one special one, I believe, which uh, you gave away. Yes, it was the one that the local yacht club actually got from me. Uh, they use it actually for their cup for a race. They, um, they sort of put all the local names of the clubs around the edge of it. And so it's all beautifully inscribed uh, now. I don't know whether they put whiskey in it or not. <laughs> <laughs> Why were they made so nice? Because they really are very nice. Oh, well, I think it's just because probably years ago they needed them for a wash stands and they had the bowl and jug and all to match, so I suppose they looked pretty in a, a bedroom. Now, could you show us some of these nice ones which you've brought? Well, this one here, I think, is the special one. Uh, it's really the ex most expensive one. How I much have. did you have to pay for that £25 one? £25, this mm, one cost. Quite expensive. And well, this one, then? This one here actually was given to me by uh, friends of an old lady who died, and that is special to me. And this one also is very special. It was given to me by, again, people. Mm -hmm. um, and this one at the end? Well, this one here, I think, is very unusual. I well, don't honestly fruit. think I would like to put it in the sideboard with fruit, but <laughs> it's... What do people do with them now? Well, I don't know. I use them actually for uh, pot, putting pot plants in mostly, but I don't use them below the bed. <laughs> and what about the future? You want to build up your collection, obviously. Just, yes, still try and collect more. I, I know they are getting... It grows tremendously, Mary, and thank you very much indeed for sharing this collection with us. OK, thank you. I'm in County Derry, halfway between Garva and Lima Valley, and I'm in Ring's End Primary School. I've come up here today to make what will be an historic film. Thank you very much, children. That was lovely. You must sit down now. Mr McKee, maybe you'd like to call the roll for us, please. And answer your names, please. P4 boys, James Gold. Sir. P5 boys, Russell Hart. Sir. P5 girls, Pamela McPherson. Sir. P7 girls, Iris McPherson. Sir. And Michelle Turner. Sir. Right now, children, your homework last night was to write a poem about the school, so could you get them out, please, so that I could have a wee look at them? Yes, you've guessed it. This must surely be the smallest school in the province. Ringsend Primary has one teacher and only seven pupils. 
and with over a century of service to this little community, what a shame that it must now close at the end of this term. But maybe the children should have the last word. Our school by Russell Hart. Ringsian School is very small. The teacher knows us all. We do our work without complaints. We all are like seven saints. Our, our school. Our school is a little place. Into it we do not race. We learn to read and write and get work to do at night. When the school bell rings, we all collect our things. And into the room we go to see just what we know. Our school, by Iris McPherson. Now there are so few of us, we can't even fill a minibus. Seven pupils, one teacher, no meals, no cooks. Soon we'll be handing in our books. Our school, by Pamela McPherson. Some four years ago, maths and English I did not know. Learning subjects went to my head. Early at night I went to bed. Now as the school is closing down, we put on a very sad frown. To another school we shall go, and oh dear oh, the tears will flow. And oh dear oh, the tears will flow. They had great fun making that film, and a lovely group of youngsters they are. My final visitor this evening is Tweaky. I don't know whether Tweaky is going to speak to me or not. Hello Tweaky. I know if Tweaky isn't going to speak, Mrs. Anne Jeffrey, who has Tweaky as her pet, mm. will talk to me about him. Why have a Jack Doan as a pet? Um, just I advise anyone, if they're given a Jack Daw, look after it, see if they can try and get it back out into the wild. But I wouldn't advise anyone to take a Jack Daw at all. How did you manage to get Tweaky? Um, one of the children found him. He had blown out of a nest and uh, brought him to me. And we got some expert advice and we discovered we had to feed him about every 20 minutes. So we did this. We thought he would have went off back to the wild, but he didn't. He became so humanised that he decided to stay. That was it. You know. So he's obviously been spoiled, I'd say. Always spoiled, yes. <laughs> What's <laughs> special about him? For I'm sure he is very special. <laughs> he's frightened <laughs> of all the studio lights. Um, well, he's very intelligent for a start. You know, he is a very intelligent uh, bird, aren't you? Uh, he has he all the characteristics of a jackdaw. Is, is he mischievous? Oh, he's mischief mischievous and he's destructive. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And does he like bright things? They're usually uh, thieves. Oh jackdaws. yes, uh, he likes uh, <laughs> jewellery. Yes. And what uh, kind of things does he do? Pretty money. He usually hides them, and you'll find them stored somewhere on the top of a cupboard, or you know, something like that. Mm -hmm. you know? So it's quite difficult. He's gone off. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's up there. He's all right. He's just at your chair. No. There he is. Okay. Uh, what has he stolen <laughs> recently? Oh, he's taken rings, and uh, oh, he'll come down and he'll steal things off your plate, like your whole egg. Yes. And take off with it, and leave a right mess over the windowsill, and things like that. You I know? believe. Jack Dawes are supposed to be uh, sort of uh, gregarious uh, creatures. Does he not feel lonely on his own? No, he doesn't. He enjoys, well, he enjoys company, but he, he likes to uh, go out and fly around and, as I say, terrorise the neighbourhood. Mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. As is obvious here, where he has flown <laughs> off now. <laughs> what do you oh, feed him on? Back. Well, he likes prawns and he likes chips and tomato ketchup, stuff like that. Um, I don't know whether he's... He's more interested in what's going on around him at the moment, yes. I think. He'll maybe have a prod. He's quite a discerning he eater, isn't he? he might. Might. No, no <laughs> he's, he's going to throw it around me. What about no. chips? I suppose he maybe what not about have... If he wouldn't, if he rejects a prawn, he'll probably not have chips. What about this? Come on. How he's long do you think he'll live, he's just, uh, Well, edgy, I'm not really terribly yes. sure he's now about them. I have heard that they can live up to about 20, 24, 25 years, but I'm not really terribly sure about that. And... In, in between, so do you I've got think... this all ahead of me still. <laughs> <laughs> well, you think someday he'll fly away? I doubt it very much. If he does, I think it'll be accidental. And uh, he's so humanised. If he fell into the wrong hands, he would go down near cats. He would go near dogs who wouldn't understand. You know. <laughs> yes, and that might be the finish of him. That would be the finish of him. I'm afraid. <laughs> you know. Well, thank you very much, Anne. Now here's Joe. One, three, three. Take eleven. Hello. 
You might think with all this sunshine and ice and snow that I'm in... Sorry, sorry. That I'm in the Alps, but I'm not. I'm actually in County Down in the Kingdom of Moan. Up. Sorry, sorry. Up in the heart. Hold on, I put on the handbrake. Well, you've guessed we didn't come to look at Spelgadam at all. We've come to look at this little road which leads down the hill towards the two gates at the foot of the dam. You can see it's quite steep and the remarkable thing is when you turn off the engine, let go of the brake, for some reason or other the car runs back up the hill and at quite a speed. Now the ice and snow today have been a help but take my word for it, it does actually work in normal conditions. Well this sort of road is known as an electric hill or an electric bray and we know of a couple of others in the province. There's one at Castle Robin near Lisburn and another one over at Gorchen. Well, you've seen now what's behind the thing. Let's do it again for fun. Okay, well, we're actually driving down towards the gates at the moment. You have to drive against the downward slope here. Right, here we are at the gates. Turn off the engine, out of gear. Handbrakes off, and yes, sure enough, we're moving slowly back up the hill. Yes, walls going past here quite quickly. The ice and snow do seem to be a bit of help, but it really is great fun. Certainly, it's the cheapest form of motoring that I know. Coming up towards a bend here at the top, here the snow crunching underneath turning round at the bend. Yes, just, yes, here we are, back up the top of the hill. Well, I did enjoy that. Sure beats buying petrol for the car. I think I'll have another go. Thanks, Joe. I'm glad you got it right at the end. And talking of end, that's where we are. Do join us again for our next programme. I leave you with some more music played by the organ at the Argery. Good night. No, no, we're not going to be cooking donkey. A taste of Ulster. 6.35, BBC One, Friday night, is visiting the Isle Lamas Fair. And, of course, we'll be, we'll be trying the yellow man and a wee touch of dulse. He just keeps quiet for half a second. <laughs> but we'll also be visiting a master butcher who's the champion of champions. And we'll be going a few miles down the road by motor car, you'll be relieved to hear, in search of some oat cuisine. So join us. Those are just two of the courses on this week's menu. A Taste of Ulster, 6.35, BBC One. What do you think of that? <laughs>